Well, here we are out on the main concourse at the Crucible. Of course, this illustrious trophy is what the 17-day marathon is all about. And those of you who've bought tickets or you've seen the Crucible, this is where you normally see people hanging around or the occasional television feature. But we're going to take you on a little bit of a backstage tour. Thanks very much. It could be a bit bumpy. We're not absolutely certain who we're going to bump into. This is where the post-match interviews take place. Every player has to come in here, win or lose. We've had some entertaining press conferences and some fairly monosyllabic ones as well. This is the great and the good of the British press. I'm going to keep my voice down a little bit because the time of day we're in here, these guys are filing their pieces. So they're working extremely hard. We've got writers for The Times. We've got uh, Jamie Broughton in the corner broadcasting to all the BBC regions. Ivan Speck. We've got the Daily Mail. Hector Nuns of The Times. John Skilbeck for PA. Charlie in the corner, the posh boy. We love him. He's writing for Sports Beat. And over here, we've got Ivan Hershevitz, the, uh, the chief of the press room. Ivan, just give us a real basic rundown of, of what your 17 days involves. Well, it's, it's based in this press room, you know, it's long days sometimes, nine o'clock in the morning until midnight, but um, but we love it, you know, and it's been a, an exciting tournament and the adrenaline kind of keeps you going. How many column inches has Ronnie O'Sullivan helped to generate? Yeah, obviously he's dominated the, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the coverage. I'm sure if you have a look on the media wall outside, you know, a lot of the stories about him and I'm sure if he keeps going in the tournament, that's going to stay the same. But I think um, generally, um, you know, the guys here who work right from the Nationals are trying to write stories about the other players as well because, you know, this nonsense about there being no characters in the game is just not true and, and, it's, and some of these guys are trying to prove that. And there have been some amazing upsets over the last few days, which I know is not necessarily always great from the Seeds perspective. But as far as generating stories, the likes of Detuet, Poomjang, Allen, John Higgins going out in the first round, there have been some really intriguing stories and results. Absolutely. I mean, Poomjang was a great story in the first week. What about Robert Milkins, you know, coming out with all the, all the stuff about um, the, the troubles that he's gone through in his life and, and how he's turned it around. And that's a great human story and, and people are interested in that kind of thing. And, and it's good that that's come out this week. Great stuff. Keep up the hard work, Ivan. And come this way, Ivan made mention of the cuttings wall. 17 days a long tournament. In fact, it's one day longer than an Olympic Games. And every day, Ivan and the rest of the team put up a little snapshot cross-section of all the broadsheets and red tops and the headlines that have been written uh, by the journalists in that room we've just been in. Just uh, giving you a little snapshot as to how the tournament's unfolded. And by the end of the 17 days, you can see there, we've already started to go on the far wall. By the end of the championship, it will be back up to about here. Right, my cameraman is Johnny, so he's, uh, he's going to earn his money. We're not going to speak to them because they work extremely hard, but this is where our hard-working cameramen, the guys you see dressed in black, this is where they tend to congregate and get their meals on board in the one hour between sessions. A really nice bunch of boys, and they do make it look easy, but they work extremely hard, and they're all going to pay me a fiver for saying that later on. I'm uh, just going to say, knock on the... See if Mike Ganley's at home in the tournament office. Ah, he is actually coming really briefly. You always have to knock on the boss's door. Uh, Mike, it might sound easy running a tournament like this because you've been here for so many years and everything's already in place, but this is hard work from your perspective, isn't it? Yeah, it's a long old day and it's a long old tournament. It's sort of, uh, we're here for 17 days play and uh, four or five days rigging on the back of the qualifiers. So uh, we're looking forward to the final weekend. Have you enjoyed it so far? I mean, I know you're a massive snooker connoisseur. There have been some great stories. Yeah, no, it's, it's been good. I mean, it's gone quite smoothly snooker-wise, so uh, let's just hope it continues like that. Cool. OK, cheers, Mike. We'll get out of his way before he starts fining me or telling me off. He normally tries to keep us on a bit of a leash here, and why not? Along the walls here, you've got reminders of all the different champions, and it really just does help to reinforce the sense of history we have with this tournament. Well, here we are in the tournament office. There's Pat and her son Nick. This is where all the this is where all the referees come in and chill out. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty calm in here at the moment, but it's normally quite busy. Right, this is the champions board. So this is where we call them the flash interviews. So when the match is finished, uh, if they're still live on the BBC. Uh, I usually come out here and do a quick minute and a half with the players because um, they like TV like to capture the emotion 
literally at, as they come off the stage. But it's not a specific room. It's literally just called the Champions Board, and there's people wandering up and down in the corridors. So um, TV's never quite as glamorous as you think. We're very briefly going to have a quick look in one of these dressing rooms, and then we're going to get out of the way here because we're, we're fairly close to the next session coming in, and the player who will be involved is Sean the Magician Murphy. And you can see here, his water's lined up, he's got his teas and coffees. All these are the programmes because um, World Snooker have involvements with various different causes and they try and get signatures of all the main players. But this is a World Championship quarter-finalist dressing room. As I said, it's not necessarily the, the most glamorous, but um, this is where the players come and take a moment to prepare and get themselves ready for appearing on the biggest stage of all. Just follow me back out if you can. My cameraman's coughing, sorry about that. He's, he hasn't worked this hard for the rest of the championship. Uh, right, okay. We will very quickly just go along here and have a look at the practice tables. I may have to go very, very quiet when we get in there. We do quite a lot of backstage tours here for VIPs and people who've been snooker fans for a long time. And sometimes we don't stay in the practice around the practice tables very long, because obviously this is um, this is a very important time for these guys, and it's very important that we're respectful of the context of what they're preparing for. So we will have a look. Watch on. Oh, well, actually, for all our whispering, there's nobody in here. But normally you'd have players in here. And uh, it goes without saying that in the early stage of a tournament, when there's 32 still involved, time on the practice tables is quite difficult to get. But the nearer it gets to the end of a tournament, the fewer players there are and the more time they get on the main table. So it's very, it's usually very quiet in here. There's the TV gantry in the corner. Jason Mohammed normally gets the BBC on air in the mornings for the 10 o'clock. And rather than being in the main studio, he'll be standing there, maybe with one or two players knocking up in the background. But this is a... This is a very special place for the players to have, to come and just quietly go through a few balls, get themselves in the mood, and get themselves ready to perform on the big stage. Speaking of which, when they've finished knocking up, they make their way down here. And I imagine, those mere mortals among us can only imagine what it must be like to make your way along. And there are reminders of the great players that grace this game everywhere. There's Mark Allen and John Higgins. Both of them went out in the first round, unfortunately, but um, great players, and they've contributed an awful lot to snooker over the years. And when they've gone and spent a bit of time in their dressing rooms, they'll wait out here. They might hear me warming up the crowd a little bit. And then when it's their turn, they come past these doors. And this is when it really does hit home that showtime is approaching. You've got the big backdrop here. Again, as with everything here at the Crucible, it might not necessarily be as big as you perceive it to be if, uh, if you watch it on TV. And right here is where the player waits. There's normally a cameraman on a handheld, scooping down low for a dramatic angle. Players can hear the other guys being introduced to the crowd. They hear the roar. And from what they tell me, this is where the hairs on the back of the neck really begin to uh, to stand up. Those are the commentary boxes there. I'll just open the door really briefly. But you've probably seen shots inside the uh, commentary booths. The, they normally put stats on the uh, tables for the two guys. Obviously, we have some world-class former world champions who do the commentary. But um, they have stats boards. They have all sorts of assistance here to make sure that the right information is imparted to the audience. Watch your step there Mr cameraman and then you pull this back and this is it this is the big stage and we can only imagine what this must feel like to be a player walking down here saying hello preparing for action it's an amazing arena the crucible because it's because the playing surface is, is slightly lower than the first tier of seats, it really does have a sort of coliseum type atmosphere. And you can see that the seating, not only are the players sitting so close to one another, but certainly on this seat, if you're in A11, you're so close to the action, you could literally lean over 
and touch the player on the shoulder. So this is this is what the hard work's all about. All those years that these guys have put in five, six hours a day in practice at their local club. This is what many of them dream about. And this is the moment where all that hard work comes to fruition. And the other thing to say about this arena, if uh, Johnny just pans round, it might look quite small when there's nobody in it. But believe you me, when there's 950 people in those seats, this arena can look very, very big and can generate an awful lot of noise. It's a brilliant place for snooker to happen. It's a knowledgeable audience. It's a privilege to be part of, uh, to be part of the snooker scene. They're great guys to work with. And the number one priority is that everybody sitting there and all the people working backstage, and even for my part, being the MC, it's important that when those 32 players step out every single time, even if they're seven one down in a session we need to make sure they feel as special as possible because without them none of this happens so that's your backstage tour hopefully you've seen a few little bits that maybe you haven't uh, on previous broadcasts and if you fancy a proper backstage tour buy a vip ticket and come and join us next year